Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, it's an election year in Turkey, and there are changes coming in the media landscape online, and signs that the mainstream media are changing their tune on the Erdogan government. A crusading magazine in India, and the sexual assault allegations that may prove fatal for Tehelka. Myanmar is still waiting for the new media law promised by the civilian government. Meanwhile, five journalists there are in the dock. And there's virtual, then there's reality on Facebook. That's our web video of the week. The media story in Turkey, one we looked at a few weeks ago when Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan's government was scrapping with critical news outlets over a corruption scandal, is now intensifying. On February 10th, the editor of a leading newspaper went on the air to say that government pressure had created a climate of intimidation for the media in Turkey. That came after audio files leaked online purportedly showed his publication altering its news coverage at the behest of executives who had close ties to the ruling party. Just two days before that, thousands of protesters were on the streets after the Turkish parliament voted to change the internet law. If made official by President Abdullah Gül, the amended law will bolster existing legislation that has already allowed for the blocking of myriad websites in the country. The government says that the law is not censorship, it's regulation. However, critics point to the timing. With elections coming up in Turkey and the fact that the internet is leaking official secrets like a sieve, their argument is that the Erdogan government is trying to curb the free flow of information online. Our starting point this week is Istanbul. In Turkey, every government that came and gone has tried to influence media outlets. This is a new concept. When you look, it's Turkish media ownership that's the real issue. There is no media, no press, which operates solely to inform. It's not only the government that we need to criticize. The media needs to look at the mirror. In the government's corner, a professor of law and member of the ruling AK Party's Central Committee. And a Turkish businessman with media connections who defends Prime Minister Erdogan's approach to the media. On the other side, a columnist and a digital journalist who say the media have their faults, but that the government has gone too far and that the new internet law is just the latest example of that. If enacted, the law will allow the government to take down any online content it wants without first going to the courts. In the wake of a government corruption scandal where much of the grainy video evidence first appeared online, many Turks have surmised the new law is designed to stem the flow of information. Prime Minister Erdogan says the law is not about censorship, but individual rights. Erdogan has called social media a scourge, which may have confused his four million followers on Twitter. Let me give you an example. The Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu, on when the Gezi Park incidents were happening, they were putting his home address on Twitter and broadcasting it to everybody, saying, go and raid his house. Would we accept it in this society as norm? We wouldn't. So that's what he's talking about. Not necessarily Twitter or Facebook or any other social media outlet out there being managed itself, not itself, but the way it is used in Turkey. That's what he's talking about. In the past, you need to contact ISPs when your individual rights were violated. You would have to wait for their response. If that didn't happen, then you needed to go to court and then to the telecommunications regulator. So you could wait for up to 8, 9, 10, 12 days. And in 12 days, there's no virtue, no value left. The damage has already been done. So the politicians became aware of that, which is why they had to take this step. Although the government is trying to present this new bill as a device to control content and not to limit freedom, that is a lie. With this new bill, the decision to ban or stop a publication is taken from the courts and given to the bureaucrats. This is very clear. They can't deny it. There used to be a five-day waiting period. Now they say a publication can be shut down in four hours. But the issue is not the speed of the decision. It's who decides. 
Are they shutting down content that is morally inappropriate, or is it content that the government is unhappy about? This also comes after the graph probe became public, and uh, you know all the information is now flowing on the internet. So there is a strong speculation on the streets that the prime minister is taking all these measures because he wants to control the flow of information that's going to hurt him. That speculation on the Turkish street turned into demonstrations and suspicions over the government's agenda were reinforced with the recent deportation of an Azerbaijani journalist working for an opposition newspaper called Today's Zaman. Mahir Zeynalov's tweets on the corruption story led to a criminal complaint from Erdogan himself before the journalist's visa was deemed to have expired. When he was deported, he posted a selfie from the plane back to Baku. Again, there are two versions of what happened in this one incident. His work permit is ended. They've written to uh, today's Zaman newspaper. Today's Zaman newspaper didn't deal with it in time. It's a technical, legal issue. His work permit has ended, so he had to leave the country, and he knew. So it wasn't that he was deported. And when he went back to Azerbaijan, where he's from, he could apply. And if he gets the visa, he can come back. Even a shepherd in the mountains knows that Mahir Zeynalov was deported because of his tweets, even though the official reason was that his journalist visa had expired. It's clear that he wasn't liked by the government. Whoever is against the government either gets sacked, gets shut down, as happened to me, and on this occasion they deported Zeynalov because it was easy. As we have reported before on the Listening Post, the Turkish media problem is largely structural. Most TV channels back the AKP not because of a shared ideology, but because of shared interests. The conglomerates that own those channels tend to be big, diversified, and they do a lot of business with the government. Their relatively small media holdings temper their criticism of that government and often hire executives tied to the ruling AKP in order to preserve their owners' other bottom lines. When the Jenner Group, which owns multiple media outlets, bought another channel last year, Show TV, critics saw the transaction as a reward for supporting the government. Earlier this month, a series of audio files appeared online, including a conversation between the editor at one of the group's papers, Haberturk, and an executive. The two discussed an opinion poll and how to manipulate figures to the government's advantage. They agreed on what numbers to publish, but not before the executive ran the plan past the prime minister's son. This past week, the editor appeared on CNN Turk. Yeah, bugün Türk medyasında herhangi bir yönetici kalkıp da ben şimdiye kadar bir zılgıt yemedim, ben bana şimdiye kadar müdahale olmadı demesi mümkün değil. Fatih Altaylı. Uh... Fatih Altaylı is a controversial journalist. There are those who criticize him and those who glorify him. I don't want to get into this debate because all the audio files were obtained illegally. The government does have influence over some media groups which support it. And this creates the perception of pressure for those who work there. He's not saying something new. He's kind of stating uh, the obvious. But again, he isn't necessarily just talking about AK Party or the current prime minister. Because this isn't something that's all of a sudden happened because of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. This is a practice that's been going on for quite a long time. This is media, how it sees its role in Turkish politics. Yes, the Prime Minister certainly abused the power, but it's also Haber Turk that didn't act responsibly because it is a privately owned channel and they immediately gave in to the Prime Minister's pressure. So both sides acted terribly wrong on this example, and which is not an isolated incident in Turkey, which is very unfortunate. And Turkey goes to the polls this year, with local elections next month and the presidential round expected in August. Will Prime Minister Erdogan's AKP continue to pressure the media and patrol news coverage online? There is no reason to expect otherwise, because the stakes are so high. Or will the Turkish media finally draw an editorial line in the sand and stop looking at the bottom line and the corporate ties that bind their owners to the government? Watch this media space. Our Global Village Voice is now on the latest developments on the media story in Turkey. There is a lot of pressure now, not only on oppositional uh, newspapers and TV, but also on the Gülen 
run or Gulen affiliated media. And one of them is the Zaman outlet, one of their journalists. Uh, a foreigner with uh, all legal documentation in Turkey was dispelled and had to had to leave and go to Azerbaijan. But it's only the last uh, drop into uh, into something that uh, that is already very bad for the media. There's also a growing number of journalists which are feeling really uncomfortable in the way how they have to report about the recent events. The media is the fourth estate in the society, especially also in the Turkish one, where you do not have a really strong parliamentarian opposition. So for me, it is a democratic test for Erdogan. Is he able to guarantee democratic rights or not? Time now for listening post news bites. We got an interesting glimpse this past week into editorial policy at some major American news outlets. On February 10th, the Associated Press, the Washington Post, and the New York Times all ran similar stories quoting anonymous government sources, saying that the Obama administration was considering a drone strike to kill an American citizen suspected of planning an attack on the U.S. from overseas. The AP and the Post both omitted one key bit of information, the location of the potential strike. The AP said it had withheld the information at the request of officials from the government who said that publishing it could interrupt ongoing counter-terror operations. Despite a similar request to withhold the location, the New York Times published it. It was Pakistan. Carolyn Ryan, the Times' Washington bureau chief, said that while the paper takes such interventions from the government seriously, I worry that their requests to withhold information have become almost blanket policy. She added, when they made the request to us, we pressed them for an explanation and they never responded. What's more, the Obama administration has made it very clear that it is going to target anyone in Pakistan who was affiliated with al-Qaeda, so that certainly should come as no surprise to any such person hiding out in Pakistan. Many American media critics have argued that news organizations there often fail to stand their ground when the Obama administration tries to tell them what can and cannot be published in the name of national security. Here at the Listening Post, we often report on demonstrations that are called to protest the coverage that certain news outlets provide or when governments try to curtail media that are critical of them. But we've never seen a protest in one country over the treatment of a media outlet in another. On February 9th, dozens of Ukrainians protested alongside a larger political demonstration in Kiev, and they were sending a message to Moscow. The week before, a channel called TV Dozhd in Russia was dropped by most of its network carriers. The official reason was that the channel had posted a survey question on its website that supposedly offended Russians. The authorities accused TV Dozhd of going beyond what was acceptable from the moral and ethical point of view of our people, while commentators argue that the real issue was the channel's anti-Kremlin stance. TV Dozhd has been one of the few media outlets in Russia that has not followed the pro-Moscow line in its coverage of protests, be they anti-government rallies in Russia or in Ukraine. A similar protest in Moscow over what organizers called political pressure to silence TV Dozhd resulted in at least 41 people being detained. All of this occurred against the backdrop of Sochi and the global media flocking to the Winter Olympics there. In Myanmar, five journalists have been charged with disclosing state secrets in a case that sparked concerns that the new government is using tactics against the media that come straight out of the former military junta's playbook. Four reporters and the CEO of the Yangon-based weekly Unity Journal were arrested after the publication of a story on a secret weapons factory in the northwestern city of Pauk. The article stated that the weapons plant was built in 2009 on land confiscated from farmers. The accused have been charged under the State Secrets Act, including trespassing and entering a prohibited area. If convicted, they could face up to 14 years in prison. Press freedom groups in the country have criticized the handling of this case, arguing in a joint statement that the government has failed to follow the correct procedures and that taking people in casually and not letting them go is very similar to what the former military regime used to do. Presidential spokesman Ye Tut defended the action and said that police had followed all procedures according to the criminal code. He also said, this is not about press freedom, it is a national security issue and even the U.S. will take legal action on an illegal intrusion to a defense factory. Myanmar's long-awaited new media law was finally passed by both houses of parliament late last year, but it still awaits a presidential signature before it actually goes into effect. In its heyday, which was relatively brief, the Indian news magazine Tehelka specialized in exposés, reporting corruption, investigating scandals, uncovering cover-ups. 
In Hindi, the magazine's name means sensational, a commotion, an event that shakes things up. However, three months ago, Tehelka itself was shaken by a news story. Allegations that founding editor Tarun Tejpal had raped a junior employee led to his arrest and a string of resignations at the magazine. Ever since the scandal broke, the bad press has been unrelenting. Tehelka's credibility has been shredded, and the magazine's brand and its staff have been doing their best to stay afloat. The Indian media industry, better known for quantity than quality, can ill afford to lose a pioneering publication like this one. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on Tarun Tejpal and Tehelka. For a magazine known for blowing open the doors of government secrecy and lifting the lid on corporate concealment, Tehelka's offices in New Delhi are in lockdown these days. Nobody wants to talk about how the magazine is doing. It's been three months since the magazine's frontman, Tarun Tejpal, stepped down from his post as editor to fight allegations of sexual assault. In a country where rape has been such a big story, the Tejpal case threw the magazine into a tailspin. The crusading newsman heading for court and his deputy, an articulate, prominent face on the media scene, resigning. I understand that Tarun's letter to me sounds like an act of vanity. After she was accused of downplaying the seriousness of the charges and mismanaging the situation. His deputy resigned and several other top journalists also resigned. And its credibility uh, at rock bottom. Uh, I'd be really surprised if they can swim against all this tide. So I think probably the impending demise of Telka is sometime going to come very soon. But that, that would be quite a sad moment for any publishing. To what extent will Tehelka survive the uh, case against its founder editor? Tarun Tejpal, it's a tough question, but my sense is that uh, already the way in which the magazine handled this problem uh, has created a huge crisis of confidence and crisis of credibility. Tehelka broke into the Indian news consciousness in the year of its launch in 2000 with a sting operation using undercover filming that exposed systemic corruption in the country's favorite sport, cricket. For the three cricketers from the national team, including the captain, found guilty of match fixing, the Helka story was a career ender. Now I need uh, your favor. It was another hidden camera operation, revealing bribery, the Indian Defense Ministry, and the arms trade. The president of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, that was leading the government at the time, resigned as well. The Helka wasn't just claiming scalps, it was breaking new ground in Indian journalism, and other news outlets, in a period of explosive growth in Indian media, copied the secret camera tactics in their investigations. But those days are gone, and when we tried to reach the new executive editor for comment on the Helka's future, he said he was not authorized to speak publicly. With Tejpal in jail awaiting trial and everything at the magazine, from finances to editorial policy under scrutiny, the Helka's team seems focused for the moment on just keeping the publication afloat and keeping questions from the media at bay. The magazine's first issue this year was one part self-reflection, one part self-critique, one part self-praise, and one part a plea for survival. The first issue of 2014 on the idea of the Helka has a number of people who point out that the institution of the Helka is bigger than its founder who's currently behind bars. There are enough people who are sincere, who are dedicated, who are still associated with the magazine. When it started off uh, as, a, as a website, it had uh, idealistic goals, it was an alternate view of things, of what is happening. They covered stories which nobody else would touch. And I think that they went through a lot of struggles trying to survive and raise funds because if you're writing stories against the government, that government is not going to give you advertising. Then the corporates, if you're doing stories against the corporates, why would they place ads in your magazine? So you're then doing a subversive uh, uh, product which is asking the same people who you're being subversive to or against to place money on you. A few years before the sexual assault scandal broke, the Helka's financial realities began to erode the magazine's anti-establishment credentials. In 2011, Tarun Tejpal launched ThinkFest, 
an annual event bringing together the best and brightest from India and around the world to discuss new ideas. The event was sponsored by a slew of big businesses, including steel, infrastructure and government-owned companies. It roused suspicions that the Helka was turning its back on its muckraking reputation and was going corporate. This whole episode of setting up uh, a so-called think fest in a fancy hotel in Goa, you call important people and you debate and you discuss quote-unquote ideas and in the evening we will booze and have a good time. And in the same way, who are your sponsors? Your sponsors are some companies who don't exactly have such a great reputation. They include mining companies, include power companies. It tarnishes the reputation of the entire organization. It speaks of uh, a perennial problem in the Indian media, which is that in order to survive here, editors and publishers feel that they have to do X, Y, Z things. They make compromises. It's unfortunate that a magazine that set out to change things ultimately succumbed to some of those very practices as the bigger, more explicitly or openly corporatized media houses did. Please welcome Sarah And the Goa conference happens to be the scene of Tejpal's alleged crime. The Goa police has booked him for rape and is all set to summon him over the allegations soon. It was at the ThinkFest conference this past November where the assaults he is accused of took place. The Helka faces a struggle to do more than just survive. It has a credibility problem that could last much longer than the Tejpal case. And all of this comes at a time when the Indian electorate needs as much quality journalism as they can get. This is an election year. The fact is that India is the world's largest democracy. And in politics, there is sort of a pushback from the people. And I hope in media also, and not just in media, probably in many institutions in the country, there is scope for such a reformist uh, movement. Unfortunately, what happened to Tarun Tejpal has rubbed off on the media. So we have a very, very paradoxical situation. A journalistic institution which stands for all that is good and positive about the fourth estate. When its own founder is accused of sexual harassment, when, when its own editorial leaders are accusing of pandering to the rich and the powerful, that creates a huge crisis of confidence. More Global Village voices now on Tehelka and the scandal engulfing the magazine. First, I think it's very clear, given that Tarun Tejwal has been in jail for three months without any bail, that this is not just justice, but also some kind of political vendetta. Now, what this means is that he may not be back at Tehelka for a very long time, and the magazine's going to have a very hard time surviving, even if it does. It won't be the same Tehelka, it won't be the same in its political leanings, it will not be the same in its journalistic and literary merits. The demise of any news publication is not one to cheer about. But in my mind, Tehelka died the day the doing of its former founder editor got public. There are of course many who will tell you that uh, the publication had died even earlier when its promoters were found to be hand in glove with dubious sources of funds. So to answer your question whether India is going to sob if Tehelka were to die, Yes, it would. But uh, for Tarun Tejpal, I don't think uh, too many will shed a tear. Finally, Facebook has just had its 10th anniversary, which it marked in a self-reverential kind of way. Of all of the videos that we saw on the anniversary, the following one struck us as one of the most honest. It basically says, as far as my friends know, my life is perfect. And it comes from a couple of comedians from Atlanta, Georgia, Tripp and Tyler. It touches on Facebook's idea of friendship, the selfie thing, those sidebar ads we never click on, and that uncomfortable moment when you get poked by your parents. We've made the honest Facebook movie with its more than five million hits, our web video of the week, and we'll see you next time at The Listening Post.